Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Breer. And I am the director of the Melbourne Energy Institute at this university. Uh, before we begin today's seminar, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Bunurong people who have been custodians of this land for many thousands of years. And we, of course, acknowledge and pay respects to their elders past and present. I thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today for the fifth instalment of our MEI Network seminar series. Uh, today's talk focuses on green hydrogen as an alternative to natural gas. Um, we've had some wonderful presentations this year, and if you've missed any of those, you're very welcome to go to the MEI website, energy.unimelb.edu.au. And if you go under the events um, uh, part of that website, you'll find all the previous seminars and recordings and associated information. Anyway, today's talk is going to be given by Michael Belinsky, who's CEO of Siemens Energy uh, in the Asia, Australia and Pacific region. Uh, Michael's worked in the sector for more than 35 years and has been with Siemens since 1996. He's also a very generous member of the advisory board of the Melbourne Energy Institute and has given us a great deal of assistance. That includes his giving numerous lectures to students over the years, uh, even before I was MEI director. Um, Michael and I share a passion of gas turbines in particular, uh, but today he'll be talking to us about green hydrogen and the role it can play in getting Australia to net zero emissions. So thanks for joining us, Michael, and welcome. That better, ah, much better. This switch is on. This helps apparently. Um, so we're talking today, and where should I stand here? Is that yeah? Um, with green hydrogen as an alternate to natural gas. Now, I guess I'd like to be mildly provocative, if that's okay. Just a little, just a little. Um, in that, I guess um, people coming to the lecture might think we're talking about we're well, putting hydrogen as an alternative to natural gas in our pipelines in towns and cities, so we we burn hydrogen on stoves and so on. Um, so that, that's one approach we could take. Um, but I, I think that's actually an example of some of the poor debate we see in the energy sphere at the moment, where we see people who have a, a particular technology or a particular issue they'd like to push, and they grab hold of that and, and they try and push it almost religiously and ignoring the overall context. And I think as scientists and engineers, we're all trained to analyze a situation find the, the best available technology and apply that technology. And, and that for me seems to be not what, what happens in some parts of the industry at the moment. Um, so what I'd like to do with, with your patient's permission, we've got about 45 minutes, Michael, I think, for my presentation, then, then we have a discussion. Um, what I'd like to take you through is a, a holistic view of where um, energy in Australia might go over the next 30 years. And in that process, and it will take us a few minutes to get there to then see what part green hydrogen could, should, or must take in our clean energy future. Okay. So my goal in this is to answer this question eventually, but to do it in the context of the whole of energy in the country, not just as a um, as an advocate for green hydrogen somehow. Yeah. Is that, is that okay? That's so. Is those introductory words I think are, are relatively important. Okay, so where um, and where this started, you'll see we're going to work through um, a view of what could energy look like by 2030. And th this this presentation actually started as an internal strategy presentation. So as Michael said, I, I work for a company called Siemens Energy. And every year, my, it's a German company. My boss is in Germany. Say something to me like, Michael, look, you're the, you're the guy in Australia. Um, you know, we're a technology company. What's your strategy? Energy is a very active thing in Australia. And about two years ago, we, we sat down and tried to do this. And, and what we realized was that about every six months in Australia, 
things change in energy so rapidly or so much that anything you said six months earlier is now completely irrelevant anymore and you start again. And that's not a great look when your people overseas are saying to you, well, you're the expert and you got it all wrong. Um, so we, we looked, thought and thought and thought about this and realized that actually we're currently in a very, very unusual situation when it comes to predicting the future, okay? Because we all know predicting the future is this very difficult thing where six months out, you can be pretty good, a year out, you get a bit worse, five years out, it's quite sketchy and 10 years out, it's very sketchy. But actually in energy, we know exactly where we want to be in 30 years. We want to be at net zero. Okay. So we thought, well, okay, why don't we, why don't we do that? Why don't we go to 2030, work out what we would have needed to have done by 2030 in order to achieve net zero and work backwards. Okay. So that then would give us a feel for the, the magnitude and the rate of act activities we have to take in order to get to this this, this goal we have of, of, of net zero by 2030, uh, 2050, sorry, I keep saying 20, 2050. Um, so that, that's what we've done here. So this, this uh, analysis takes us through that sequence of thought. And we do this in, in a couple of steps. So the first thing we want to look at is, is where today's emissions come from in the economy. And we're going to have a look at electricity generation today, because today electricity generation, as we hear constantly, is the largest single source of carbon dioxide from our economy. We then look at what would it take just to make electricity net zero. So I know this is a discussion about gas, but actually when we come to green hydrogen, electricity is very important. You know? So we look at what would it take to just make electricity net zero, and we learn some things from doing that. And then we expand that to look at the whole economy being net zero, and then we draw some conclusions from, from what that looks like. Okay, so these four steps in the in the discussion today. Okay, so if we look at today's emissions, so this, this table shows you the, the rough uh, split up of which portions of the economy produce carbon dioxide today. So we see electricity generation at 34% is the largest single grouping, if you like. And then we have, sorry. Then we have these, these other, uh, let's call them technology areas and this thing called fugitives, and then agriculture waste and land use and so on. So we're technologists and scientists in the room. Um, we've conveniently decided to ignore this stuff. We assume people still want to eat in the future and all those things. And as it turns out, fugitives are almost exclusively produced from the activities of coal mining and natural gas production. Um, so if we stop doing those two things, fugitives goes away. Okay? And all of that in the red box is around 90%. And what we focus on is these, is these technology areas, starting with electricity. Okay. And then if we look at the electricity industry today, we see the, the installed capacity, and I will ask you to remember a small number of numbers. So the installed capacity in the country is around 75 gigawatts. And uh, so this is capacity, not energy. We'll come to energy in a moment. And the, the, the big yellow triangle in this, of course, is the thing that's changed dramatically in the last decade, is the rooftop solar at 17 gigawatts. So a very large slab of the, the electricity generation capacity in country today. The energy mix, however, does look quite different to the installed capacity. So if we go back to 25 years ago in 1995, we had nearly 90% of the electricity was generated using fossil fuels. The other 10% was, was hydro. We basically had no wind or solar. So we moved forward 25 years to 2020. And now we're at, call it 75% is from fossil fuels. Around 25% is from renewables, still about 10% from hydro. Yeah. So it took us 25 years to improve by about 15%. Yeah. If we look at the new government's target for 2030, we aim to get to 18% fossil fuel electricity generation in um, about eight years time. So we'll see there's a number of substantial challenges in both any 2030 targets and 2050 targets. This is the first one. So it's taken us 25 years to do arguably the easy 15%. We're now targeting eight years to do the remainder down to 18%. It's quite challenging. 
Okay. And then you'll see this becomes relevant later. This map shows the layout of the high voltage transmission network in Australia. And uh, now this is quite unusual. So my European colleagues, when I show them this, are astounded. They have a, an image of Australia covered by transmission lines. And unfortunately, it's not quite the case. Okay, so we have the longest, skinniest high voltage network in the world down the east coast of Australia. Relatively small grid around Perth, a smaller grid around Caratha, or even smaller one around Darwin. Um, now this, this map, which shows a high voltage grid today, is actually not substantially different to what it was 30 years ago. And, and 30 years ago, that grid was created by a group of electricity commissions in each state. And essentially the high voltage grid in each state connects one or two locations of fossil fuel power generation around two or 300 kilometers away from the major load center, the capital city, some other relatively small transmission lines and relatively weak links between the states. Okay. That picture hasn't really substantially changed today. And we'll see why that becomes relevant later. Okay, so in order to begin our study of how do you decarbonize electricity? So the first step, we've produced this, this is an average day in Australia. And this graph is, is important because we'll look at various versions of this graph through the presentation. So this is 24 hours in an average day in Australia with number of gigawatts on the vertical axis. And what you can see here is coal provides the underlying base load. The green is wind, relatively consistent on average through the day. Okay. Blue is hydro. The gray is gas that comes in to cover the morning and evening peaks. The light yellow is the um, rooftop PV, dark yellow is utility PV, and the red line is the demand. So we're matching demand with generation, the usual problem for electricity generation. Okay. So our challenge here is of course, by 2050 is to replace all of the fossil fuel part with some sort of renewable el electricity. Okay, so we start off with this thought experiment where we say, let's work out how to decarbonize just electricity. And we do a couple of things. So the graph on the left-hand side, this shows over the period to 2050, the black line is the announced shutdowns of coal-fired generation. Now this announcement, and we've purposely left this, this is about two years old. So since this graph was drawn, um, Iraring and I think about this, Yulon, I think have brought forward their closure dates. Okay, so this is actually going to be, we use this as input into our model, this is actually slightly easier than the current problem. Yeah? So we shut down coal almost linearly through 2050. And we assume that during that period, people continue to use electricity as they do today. So in this first step, we don't have electric vehicles or any of those sorts of things. We assume some efficiency improvements over time. But most importantly, we recognize with the yellow line that Australia is probably the only first world economy that expects strong population growth over the next 30 years. And we all know that population growth equals growth in energy consumption. So we model with some efficiency improvements and so on that by 2050, we're actually going to have a 15% increase in electricity demand for the purposes that people use electricity for today. Okay. So, and then we create a model and we say over that period from um, the present to 2050, we can see coal declining, gas declines, and we grow renewable electricity generation via a mix of wind and solar. So we make some assumptions about the ratio. That's not really too important at the moment. It just says that we grow this renewable electricity and that's what we need to do over a 24 hour period. So we don't talk here yet about long-term storage. This is just over an average 24 hour day. Okay, so when we do all that, what results do we get? So this, the, the nice color graph over on the left, this shows us the required change in generation capacity to achieve a net zero electricity system by 2050, where we replace all of the coal and the gas 
Hydro stays roughly as is. We model that um, Snowy 2.0 comes online. The green is wind growing. The darker yellow is utility PV. Light yellow is um, rooftop PV. And the two colors of red are um, battery storage, both distributed and utility. Okay. So this is, and the, the growth is relatively linear. So we, we don't really do too much about the transition. We really look at the endpoints. And our goal in that is to get a feel for the size of the numbers. Now, we're not trying to say that in 2037, it will be that number that's clearly not the case. Now, so how, what, what are the results of that? So this table on the right, what we see is in order to achieve net zero, we need to grow utility solar at about a thousand megawatts per annum. As it turns out, that's about as much as we've been doing in the last few years. So that sounds pretty good. Distributed solar, we model growing at 2000 megawatts per annum till about 2035 when most roofs have been utilized. Yeah. Wind has been growing at around 850 megawatts per annum. We model that it grows at 2000 megawatts per annum. So two and a half times what it's been until now. We think all of those, they're actually achievable. Storage is, is more difficult. So distributed storage, we see growing at 400 megawatts per annum, utility storage around 320 megawatts per annum. Probably achievable. Yeah. So if we do all this, what, do, what result do we get over 24 hours? So in 2030, after 10 years, we see the graph changes. Demand is again shown by the red line. And here we see coal is being pushed out of generation by the heavy solar during the day. Wind has grown substantially. Hydro is about the same. Gas still acts as a balancing fuel. And then in the middle of the day, we see that the solar goes above the demand line because it's charging batteries. And here we see the batteries in red discharging later in the day. A mix of utility and um, distributed. So we can see our grid is changing. It's becoming less fossil, more variable renewable energy with storage. And then if we jump to 2050, we now have by definition, no fossil fuels. We have a very big underlying production of energy by wind. Hydro is still doing what it was doing. Much larger peaks of solar. The purple is now curtailment. Okay. And curta curtailment is an interesting conclusion. So you hear lots of discussion around people wanting to use curtailed energy somehow for free. We actually think that's an illusion. We think that in this renewable energy system of the future, you have to have curtailment by design because if you don't, this is on an average day, on a worse than average day when the wind's not shining enough and the sun's not, uh, sun's not shining and wind's not blowing, you'll have not enough energy, okay? So we have by design on an average day, a certain extent of curtailment. And you can see in the, early in the day, batteries are charging, batteries become full, we curtail, and then batteries discharge, keep discharging and then start being recharged early in the morning. Yeah. So while at present, we actually don't know how to manage a system that has this much variable renewable energy in it. I think we're confident we'll work it out by then. Yeah. And the, the rates of construction and so on seem reasonable. Now, you know, we haven't talked about gas yet. I will get to gas. So having, having um, learned many lessons in doing that model for electricity, we now change our focus to say, what does it look like if we decarbonize the entire economy? So we call this net zero everything. And we have certain questions we ask ourselves. So firstly, we aim to electrify everything wherever possible. So, and this actually means avoiding using green hydrogen or anything else. It says if you produce all of your energy using renewable sources such as wind and solar, then the best thing you can do if you need to use that energy is use it as electricity. Anything else is suboptimal, okay? So we try and electrify everything. So we stop importing petrol. We get to 100% passenger EVs by 2050. Um, we believe that something we call EVA, EVA, um, electric vehicle arbitrage, is an extremely important part of our energy future. Um, so you'll see we assume, I think, about 8% of vehicles are at any point in time connected and uh, programmed to 
charge and discharge depending what the grid is doing. And that gives us a fantastic benefit. If we can achieve better than 8%, which you would think should be possible, um, electric vehicles become an enormously important part, not just of decarbonizing transportation, but of actually managing the energy grid. Okay, we use hydrogen everywhere else that we don't use electricity. Okay. So we stop importing diesel, we stop importing aviation fuel um, and other petrochemicals, and we replace all of those fossil fuels with either hydrogen gas or its chemical derivatives, such as ammonia, such as methanol and the derivatives of those chemicals. Okay. And the hydrogen production, we'll see in a minute, becomes something like the current oil and gas industry, a massive industry that operates 24 seven. So in doing all that, we think the key design questions for us were, well, how much additional electricity do we need for all of that electricity and then producing the green hydrogen? How much more wind, solar and storage do we need to make all of that additional electricity? And how do you address the long-term storage issues of you know, three to five days of bad weather? Yeah. Okay. So then we, we, we make a lot of assumptions. And I think, well, we don't have time today to go through all of the assumptions we make. Um, our goal in all of this was to not use radical new technologies and that every assumption when seen on its, by its own, you could, a reasonable person would say, you know what? That's a reasonable assumption. Yeah. So what do we get out of this? So what we find this, this nice graph, what this shows is in the period from 2020 to 2050, this is the annual consumption of electricity. So currently in one of the earlier graphs, sorry, I forgot to point out, we consume about 220 terawatt hours per annum in Australia. Okay. If we go, the gray part is just electricity to 2050, we'll be consuming about 330 terawatt hours because of population growth, okay? What this graph shows is that as you replace all of the fossil fuels in the economy with either direct electricity, which brings us up to here, or hydrogen or its derivatives, then you end up needing to generate around 1,400 terawatt hours per annum. So four, five, six times more than we do today, okay? So that that's a, very large number. But the, the really interesting thing for me is, you'll see here, 59% of that electricity is used to make hydrogen, okay? So in our energy future, in order to decarbonize the economy, actually the, the producers of hydrogen become the largest consumers of electricity in the grid. So the largest consumer is not now people who want to use electricity as electricity, it's people who want to use electricity to make hydrogen and it's enormous. So you can see, I promised I'd eventually get back to hydrogen. So we have, yeah. Um, so we're replacing, as we said, all of those fossil fuels with hydrogen, um, in, including natural gas, but also diesel, petrol, and so on. Um, and it's the roughly 60% of the electricity of the 1400 terawatt hours per annum. Okay, so that's the demand and consumption per annum. So let's look at how we produce that energy. So this is the analog of the earlier slide. So now we, we see here this dotted black line, this is the capacity um, we have in 2020. So that's the 75 gigawatts that we currently have as capacity to produce electricity in Australia. This is that dotted black line. So by the time we get to 2050, we need, if you just, if you come to here, which is the real generation below the batteries, it's a bit less than 600 gigawatts. So call it 10 times greater than what we have now. Yeah. And to get to that point, we assume uh, distributed solar grows as it did before, 2000 megawatts per annum till 2035 when we run out of roofs. Utility solar, we've said has to grow at about six gigawatts per annum. So six times as fast as we've been doing up till now. Wind has to grow at 12,000 megawatts per annum. That's very, very challenging. We see that the EV arbitrage thing, so if we assume we have 28 million electric vehicles in 2050, by, in order to achieve that, we're gonna grow our 
available storage, just the 8% at 7,000 megawatt hours per annum. A huge impact on storage on the grid. Distributed storage, we said, we'll grow at 400 megawatts, 1,600 megawatt hours per annum. Utility storage, this is also enormous numbers, right? 10,000 megawatt hours per annum. There are estimates at the moment of how much storage we think we will need in order to manage this grid as purely renewable energy. And what does it look like? So in 2050, it looks like this. You see the black line is what we would have had in 2050, only um, with population growth and not decarbonizing. Yeah. So this massive lump of wind at the bottom, so you can see now rooftop solar is relatively small because we ran out of roofs and we built an enormous amount of utility solar. The storage is very large and we also have curtailment as before in the middle of the day by design. So then we say, well, how do we summarize all of the findings? That was a very quick run through this modeling of what the future could look like. Yeah. And we created quite a few large numbers. So I think first question really is how big is big? How big is 10,000 megawatts? Um, so if we look at solar, so we model that we're going to need 180 gigawatts of utility solar. So as it turns out, that's a, an area of land about 60 by 60 kilometers. Now, while that's an enormous thing and you, you wouldn't build it in one place, um, in terms of the area of Australia, you could imagine that's feasible. You know? And if we look at current world production is around three gigawatts per week. So we need 180 gigawatts. We need to build 135 megawatts per week for 30 years. That's quite challenging. Mm -hmm. um, wind, and so we assume 360 gigawatts of wind. That's about 70,000 turbines. That means we put 48 turbines in the ground every week for the next 30 years. Yeah. And world production at the moment is about 350 turbines a week. So right now, relative to world, we'd be grabbing about 10% of world production on a country that's, I don't know, half a percent of the world's population or something. So it's not, not really fair, but that's what we need. And then batteries is, is really tough, right? So, so batteries, we would need to be installing about 220 megawatt hours per week. And world production at the moment is about 570. So we're taking 50% of world production currently for the batteries for 30 years. The so challenging stuff. Okay, so I've got two slides here of the, some commentary about the findings. The first one is about society and economics. So we think net zero electricity is clearly achievable by 20, 2050. You know? um, net zero for everything else is, is really quite challenging. Lots of questions of how would you do this? Is this the right way? I mean, it's one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves, what else would you do? And I make one comment later on that may steer us in that direction. Um, supply chain issues will be enormous for everybody everywhere. You know? So the magnitude of the investment is really large, the equipment, the volumes of raw materials. Um, you would really think there'll be very strong competition for resources, for factory capacity, for people, skilled people. So universities putting out skilled people have to be a growth industry, you'd say, particularly ones focused on the energy sector. Mm -hmm. um, we think some technologies are likely to be chosen for the raw materials they use or don't use. So for example, we think our conclusion at the moment is lithium ion batteries um, are currently the, the technology of choice for grid scale batteries. That's unlikely to continue for any length of time. Okay, why? Because you make lithium ion batteries because they're compact and light for cars. Okay, for grid scale batteries, you don't need compact, nor or you need neither compact nor light. Um, and we think the EV manufacturers are going to push the price of lithium up. So the grid scale has to be something else. Um, regulation. We likely need a carbon price to make all of this work. And we think energy prices are going to increase. As a side comment, for me personally, I think it's really, really unfortunate that 
media and the politicians for the last decade have preached firstly a good thing, which is we need to decarbonize because we've got to address climate change, but they've joined that together with, oh, and if we do this, energy gets cheaper. I don't know how that works. Okay, it just doesn't. Um, we need to have a regulatory target for green hydrogen in order to kickstart the industry. So this is an important part of the topic for today, which is the green hydrogen thing. Currently, we have no hydrogen industry, right? So we have in Australia, the one plug for Siemens Energy, sorry, Michael, but the, um, we have a, the largest electrolyzer in functioning commercial electrolyzer in the Southern Hemisphere is installed in Adelaide. We built it. Yeah? It's a 1.25 megawatt device. Okay, so relative to the numbers we're talking about here, it's tiny. Largest thing in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's not, uh, let's call it, it's a tenth of the largest one in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have a long, long way to go. Is it, is it, but starting this, this green hydrogen industry is really difficult because currently green hydrogen is substantially more expensive as an energy source than any fossil energy source that would compete. So you have to find a way to sell the stuff. And national economics, we think the costs of all this are likely to be in the range of 5% of GDP for 50 years. So that sounds like a big number. We spend 3% on defense every year. Okay. We spent 5% for a couple of years in the 50s building the Snowy Mountains Hydro Scheme. Yeah. Doing it for 30 years is, is um, unusual. And of course, at the end of that period of investment, there'll be the ongoing capital replacement, all those things. One good thing is in Australia, all of those costs will be reduced substantially because we will no longer be importing petrol or diesel and we import enormous amounts of especially diesel. So that really, really does help the economics and in today's world, the energy security of the nation. Okay, from a technology perspective, okay, renewable generation, we see very significant growth of wind and solar. We really think when you look at the numbers and the amount of money that we're gonna spend on storage and the issues around managing a grid like this with so much renewable energy, that actually some form of base load renewable would be very, very helpful. Currently, the best idea we've got is geothermal, but geothermal's not there yet. Yeah. But you would think that there will be good drivers there for people to invest a lot more money. Doesn't seem to be happening just at the moment. Um, energy storage in a fully renewable, dependent on wind and solar energy system is absolutely critical. Yeah. The geographic distribution of renewable generation reduces the need for storage, that's really clear, especially in a continent, an island, the size of Australia. Um, the hydrogen industry acts as a free long-term storage. When the hydrogen industry consumes 60% of your renewable electricity, okay, and you have three days of bad weather, you know, little wind and cloudy, what do you do? Well, you turn your hydrogen industry off, okay, for three days, who cares? You write into the contract and you keep the lights on in the cities, you keep everything going. And then when the sun shines and wind blows again, you start the hydrogen, hydrogen industry again. You don't even need to burn hydrogen, we don't think. You just stop making the stuff. And, and that's, that's not obvious until you realize that hydrogen is 60% of the electricity. Yeah. Um, electric vehicles are really important and the electric vehicle arbitrage thing, very important in reducing the cost of storage on the grid because someone else pays for it. Who pays for it? The people own cars. Okay. Hydrogen production. So we're here to talk about gas, right? More electricity used for hydrogen than for electricity. We've talked about that and it becomes a very, very large 24 seven industry. We'll see how large in a minute. Um, hydrogen and liquid chemical derivatives are a key part of achieving that net zero. We think um, avgas has to be made as e-fuel. As e we just can't see long distance air travel coming from, from battery powered air aircraft. And impact on transmission. We saw that map earlier on of the existing transmission grid. We need a significant increase in transmission due to the geographic distribution of these new renewable energy sources. This is stuff we've already been talking about. Um, we're going to need an east-west link across the Nullarbor, right? Why? It's not just to keep the lights on in Western Australia. 
we follow the sun across the nation. The fact Australia is such a large continent means that as the sun in the morning shines in the east, we can feed the morning peak in the west. And more importantly, in the afternoon, when the sun's shining in the west, we can feed the evening peak in the east. So we think a minimum 10 gigawatt link across the Nullarbor is required, potentially quite a lot larger than that. And then linking off into solar farms and wind farms on the Great Australian Bight as you go past. Really important concept for the country. And multiple Bass Strait links, both to secure energy for Tasmania, but also to take advantage of the very uh, significant onshore wind resource in Tasmania. Um, and we think this, at the other end of the scale, residential batteries to manage solar and electric vehicle arbitrage and house virtual power plants will be really critical in making all this work. Now, whether it's house virtual power plants, street virtual power plants, or suburb virtual power plants is a bit unclear, and it may be a mix of all three. But that managing consumption and distributed storage and generation will be a critical part of making that huge grid, huge energy system work. Okay, so just a recap on the sizes. So we said the energy we're going to need to decarbonize is around 1400 terawatt hours. Now this is domestic, just Australia's domestic energy requirements. And that gets us to about 600,000 megawatts of generation capacity, about 10 times the NEM. You know? We have a lot of projects around the country that are um, proposing building a gigawatt of solar and or wind, making renewable hydrogen and exporting it. So we, we thought long and hard about how do you model export of energy in all of this picture? Yeah. So what we did, we said, look, currently we export about 4,000 petajoules of gas and 11,000 petajoules of coal per annum out of this country. So why don't we look at just replacing what we currently export with hydrogen and see what that looks like. Yeah. So another 15,000 petajoules gets us another 3,000 terawatt hours per annum of electricity. So this graph, this shows us the number of terawatt hours of electricity we would have to generate renewably in order to satisfy our domestic energy demand in a zero carbon fashion and to replace our existing fossil fuel energy exports on an energy basis with zero carbon energy, which is some form of hydrogen. And you can see it's about a third, two thirds. Yeah. So that, but that grows our, we, we then have an additional renewable capacity of another 1.2 million megawatts to build. It's quite a lot. Yeah. Okay, so we started this off with, we probably need a plan. And I think all of the big numbers just say, we absolutely need a plan. You know? So what could a plan look like? What commentary can we make about a plan? So we said, okay, we've got a goal. We now need a plan. Um, and you would think that whatever plan we develop today cannot be correct because as time goes on, we'll develop new technologies, things change, we'll need to adjust. So we need a plan that's somehow flexible as we discover new things. It's clear that we need to build an enormous amount of renewable generation. Yeah. Utility solar has to grow quickly combined with large scale storage. Rooftop solar linked with batteries, house batteries. And wind, we currently think onshore for Australia is probably the right answer. The viability of offshore really has to be tested. We know in Victoria, the government is very, very keen on offshore wind. Um, it, it will be interesting to see where, where it ends up, whether it's onshore offshore for what we've modeled doesn't really change. It might be just that you get half the number of turbines if they're offshore, if they're bigger. Um, transmission, the existing renewable energy zone concept is really good. And, and really transmission is potentially the easiest part of all this. We could develop a pretty good transmission plan today because we know where the good wind and solar sites are. You know? And yes, you would adapt it as, as time goes on. People in transmission get really hung up about making the wrong investment. We think that's nearly impossible. You might make an investment a little early. Well, so what? Yeah. It, the demand, will, you can see from the numbers, the demand must come. Um, 
And that Nullarbor link and the links to Tasmania, we think are really, really important, taking into account where the renewable generation is, where the loads are, and the geography of the nation. Electric vehicles are a really key part of the whole picture, um, but require some, some good government policy around phasing out of internal combustion engines. And then, then the near future investment. So green hydrogen, which is, we started off saying, what do we do about green hydrogen replacing natural gas? And I think the answer we see now is, it's much bigger than that. It's not just green hydrogen replacing natural gas, it's green hydrogen replacing many other fossil fuels, anything that can't be electrified. A really, really important concept. Um, and for hydrogen, for the next 10 years, 20 years, economics is the key. Currently green hydrogen, if you make it, is very, very sub-economic. We need to find a way to springboard the industry. We think that means something like um, a focus on diesel replacement, maybe natural gas dilution in the natural gas network. Although if our plan is, is to run down the suburban natural gas network, then maybe mixing green hydrogen in that network isn't such a smart idea. Um, and export at six to $8 a kilogram almost certainly doesn't work. So we think some form of regulatory target for hydrogen, just like we had a regulatory target for um, renewable electricity in the red, that worked. And the concept of a, um, a regulatory target like that says, if you have an industry that's currently too expensive and people won't buy from it, if you can develop a scheme whereby many people contribute a little bit so they don't feel the pain, and in doing that, they enable the growth of an industry that later returns benefits to those who contributed, that seems like a pretty even-handed way to act. We just need to find a way to do it. Um, blue hydrogen, so blue hydrogen is, is where we take natural gas, split it into hydrogen and carbon dioxide, typically then sequester the carbon dioxide and use that hydrogen as cheap hydrogen. It's much cheaper than making renewable hydrogen. Um, I think for us, there's still some real questions around whether the CCS can be made to work economically in multiple locations and flexibly. Um, certainly natural gas, we think if coal shuts more quickly than renewables are being built to replace it, which would seem to be the case over the next decade, then natural gas may have a really significant role as a transition fuel. And one interesting thing then is if you're then building gas turbine power plants to burn natural gas because you've shut coal, and for when the wind and sun don't, don't function, um, you can then flexibly use those plants to burn hydrogen later. The question is in Australia, do you actually ever need that? Because if you build enough renewable generation to provide the hydrogen industry, as we said, if it's bad weather, you just shut down hydrogen production. So there's a question for me whether actually gas, hydrogen burning gas turbines in Australia have a long-term future after 2050. I mentioned geothermal earlier. This is maybe a, the one dream in all this. So we haven't modeled any geothermal, but when you look at the size of the challenge, if you conclude that this might be too hard, and you say, what else can we look at that makes this easier? There are typically two technologies that are brought into the discussion. One is nuclear and one is geothermal. Yeah. We haven't modeled either of those, but I think we need to mention them. And then for Australia, technology and manufacturing, at the sort of volumes we're talking about of solar panels, of batteries, of wind turbines, does it start to make sense for us to make the things in country? Because the volumes are going to be huge. And you could argue that, um, so go off on a small tangent. So currently we see in the press and from the politicians, lots of people saying, look, we've reached, a, or we maybe reached it two or three years ago, a tipping point where solar and wind are cheaper than fossil fuels now. Okay, so that's great. And that's nominally true, except of course, they're not comparable, all right? So if I have a solar plant per megawatt or per megawatt hour, its cost of electricity is comparable to a coal plant or maybe even gas turbine plant. Um, but it only works while the sun's shining. So even over a 24 hour period, I need to build storage in order to give me consistent power output over 24 hours. As soon as I do that, the costs are way, way much higher than my equivalent fossil. Okay. So you, you could argue, I think that the, the current 
polycrystalline solar technology we use, it's still 50% more expensive than it should be, than we need it to be. And then you have to ask yourself the question, okay, how do we get that down? And the answer is, well, it's not using the current technology. So you can imagine, for example, um, laser printed solar cells that have a very thin layer of, of, of um, silicon or whatever other chemical you want to use that are punched out of factories very quickly, very lightly, that have a substantially lower cost than the current um, generation of solar panels and the same for batteries. Okay. The technologies we have today is not what we'll use in 10 years. So there's huge, huge opportunities, huge risks for those things, but we have to bring the price down. Okay, so last slide. So I think the first conclusion, when you look at the magnitude of numbers is all this really possible. Yeah? And that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. That's a very interesting question to, to debate. So we have a really clear goal now, which is great. It took us a while to get there. We now need to develop a plan. And I mean, I think you can see through this presentation and there are many others doing similar analyses to try and work out what to do for the future. We have a chance of developing a plan, but we need to have that plan and start to execute. And as I said earlier, adjust as things change. And we have to start now if we're, good, if we're going to have any chance. And green hydrogen, as we saw through all this, plays a really key part in, in getting to net zero. And it's not just replacing natural gas. It's, it's, it's derivatives will replace aviation fuel, will replace diesel, will replace some electricity. But all of this is going to require strong national and international alignment. So I, I, I wrote these words in early 2022 prior to things happening, interesting things happening in the Ukraine. And, and even prior to that, even within Australia, we had a national crisis in COVID and we couldn't get the states to align. We still have different, um, let's call them standards or regulations between states. That really isn't helpful. Really, really isn't helpful. Let alone internationally. To get along with it, there's some risks at the moment that the people walk away from COP26 you know, internationally. So we're in a very, very interesting situation. At the moment. Okay. So Michael, I've spoken for 49 minutes. Sure. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. Okay. I think I'm on now. Is that right? Good. Thanks, Mike. Michael. Yeah. Yeah. We've got some questions online and we'll have some questions from the floor as well, no doubt. So um, hands up uh, in person and then you get a microphone and fire away. So just pass the mics around, the gentleman in the middle there. And we'll, and we'll uh, hi, Cooper Shepanek from Wallace. Thanks for your talk. It's very good. Different gentleman. You mentioned um, nuclear and geothermal as the alternatives that weren't modelled. Um, and also the need for alternate storage, which is a massive opportunity. I'm wondering if you had a view on why solar thermal with thermal storage seems to have fallen off the table altogether. We used to hear mega projects planned for up near Mildura. Mm -hmm. I have not heard anything about this in years. Solar thermal with thermal storage. Why is it not yeah. being given any attention? Great in theory, it costs too much. Simple as that. Simple as that. Simple as that. It's the capital costs are currently too high. Now, you could argue that if we, um, if we built more plants, would we get better at it and reduce the cost of the technology in the usual way? Yeah. Probably. Um, solar thermal is, well, so I'm, I'm a power station guy. Right? Um, solar thermal is more like, let's say, classic power station technology. Um, that also means the technology is actually pretty well understood. That means it's pretty well able to be costed so people know what it costs to build. It also means I think that the, the abilities to come down a cost curve are much more limited than say new solar technologies, for example. So it, for me, that's a cost thing, purely cost. The, the concept is great, right? Longer term storage using solar without batteries is okay. It's too expensive. Thanks, Mike. If, if you come out, stand over here, then the people online will see 
you're, 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 better, you're better looking self than just me. Um, so that's all right. Um, we'll, we'll alternate online and in the room as well. Sorry, but one second. Um, so a bunch of questions online. Um, why is there not much hydro, pumped hydro, I assume, in, in your analysis um, when some parts of the world are rethinking about that? thinking more about that um so other than snowy 2.0 we didn't include any pumped hydro yeah um the reason is we think the the number of projects in country the number of available geographic sites currently is very small um so relative to um at the current 75 gigawatt installed capacity if we did a, a gigawatt of pumped hydro um it hardly changes the numbers so we, we didn't think it was, so there was a few niche technologies. We didn't analyze uh, wave power, for example. So yep. there may be a future for wave power. It's, ve it's a very niche technology that depends on very specific geologic uh, geographical conditions. It's small numbers relative to the, the overall picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. I'm Max Rowling from uh, Theo Braun Braunschweig. I'm guest researcher here. Uh, at Unimelp. And uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your great talk. And I was wondering where you expect all the water for hydrogen production to be coming from. Yeah, so excellent question. So we've done some very first order analysis on the water volumes. And the water volumes we would need for domestic hydrogen production are about 10% of the water currently used in households. Okay, so that's, and that's not to brush off the question about water we think at 10 percent it's still going to be a challenge and there might even be some of that water needs to be created with desalination um but it's and and, and even for households is there's a lot more water in the country used for other things for agriculture for industry and so on so so we we quote that as a number to give everyone a feel that says actually the water for hydrogen is achievable now, it's not double what the country currently uses for water, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's my prepared answer on that question. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> it's an important question though. Mm. Um, uh, and there's actually a very similar question online, which is now answered, thank yeah. you. But I'll ask another online question um, about the transmission of hydrogen versus electricity and whether or not that might mean that some of your big green hydrogen generation facilities are not connected to a national electricity grid, mm. or whether there might just be pipelines running it, in some places. Excellent question. I mean, the the, um, the engineering tells you it's you can send a lot more energy down a pipeline than you can down a transmission line. You know, that, that that works really really well. Um, we've currently. Um, in the analysis, we've made an assumption, and it's probably one of I don't know, 10 big assumptions, mm. where we've actually said, look, in order to manage um, a grid in on an island, a very large island, but an island, um, with all of this variable renewable energy, where actually you, whether you're at home or in industry, you'd like to keep your lights on it for most of the year, okay? we think the way you manage that best is by having an interconnected grid. Um, we could be proven wrong in that. But certainly our, our model is to say that, you know, especially the east-west thing and the, the links to Tasmania, um, by doing all of those things, you firstly reduce the amount of storage you have to build. That substantially improves your overall costs. And secondly, it means your risk mitigation is much better. Um, so we, we've opted that way. It could be that's a wrong assumption. Mm -hmm. um, actually, a lot of questions are flooding in now online. Did I just ask an online question? Didn't and I? And on floor as well. So I'll ask an in-room question, please. Um, thanks. Um, sure, there's plenty of questions, so we'll take um, time. This is anyway, John from Tokyo Management. Uh, uh, okay. We've already started this. Okay. So, um, okay. This is John from the Chemical Engineering Department and a very insightful sharing. Thanks very much. I've got a question regarding the demand of electricity for the green um, hydrogen. That's a huge volume of electricity, but like, what is the efficiency? Because like, what 
electricity input into the hydrogen does not necessarily equal to the electricity we're getting from there? I think we assumed around an 80% electrolyzer efficiency, roughly. So it's sort of at the upper end of what people can achieve today. Yeah. Um, so we, we don't assume, for example, 90%. It may be that by 2050, we're at 90%. Um, but as I said, we, all of the assumptions we make through the thing, we, we want to be able to stand in front of an audience and say, it's about this much. We think that's pretty reasonable. And everyone nods their heads and says, that's pretty reasonable. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering about data. I made it it's quite good. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll break my rule so that we can have more thank questions you. in the room. Thanks. Um, and thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, my name is Abby, I'm a consultant at NG Impact. And I wanted to know if you included much um, of the projected changes in climate extremes um, into your modeling, things like days over 45 degrees and um, changes in extreme winds and stuff like that. No, so we, we're currently, um, as you imagine, a study like this never ends, right? Um, so we're currently doing some work on working out correlations between wind day, you know, good and bad wind days and good and bad solar days we've done no modeling so far of what, what would the um, extreme weather events look like. It's, um, it's pretty tough already without even taking those things into account. Yeah. And we got a similar question online. So we've, we've that's, that's um, important question to answer. And then we're getting a bunch of questions online around synthetic fuels of various types. So we'll try and um, answer a few of those in one fell swoop. Well, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to <laughs> shut up, Mike. Um, so, uh, sorry, let, let me try and aggregate four or five questions. So, uh, did you factor in additional energy requirement for carbon based e fuels production, like AV gas so using yeah, DAC? Ex excellent question. So, we it's probably one of the larger gaps in our study. We currently have not allowed for the energy requirement for direct air capture. Um, why do we do that? Because we think direct air capture is currently still such an infant technology that we, to answer your question about the efficiency of an electrolyzer, we just don't know what number to use. Um, but that comes on top for collection of CO2 for then the synthesis of um, e-fuels. Mm. Then there's related questions or on that. I'll just, maybe we'll have a bit of a discussion on transport fuels and e-fuels. Um, excuse me. Uh, well, uh, several questions around what kind of assumptions, so hydrogen's being used to make synthetic kerosene for aeroplanes, save gas, mm -hmm. then what other synthetic fuels were being used using hydrogen as a feedstock and was there any i i didn't pick i didn't can we like i suppose I road that, transport and right? gas heavy duty road transport and heavy transport. road transport um whether that becomes uh, compressed hydrogen or okay. or um uh, liquid fuels is is, is unclear yep. so i think from memory we assume compressed hydrogen for most of those where we could Yep. So where we could, well, again, trying to pass the reasonable test, reasonableness test, where we could, we tried to assume the the most efficient version, which would then be compressed hydrogen rather than yet another processing. Great. Um, and so on. Great. Okay, back into the room. Hi. Um, <coughs> pardon me. There's clearly a lot to be done there. In the absence of any current advanced discussions around a renewable hydrogen target, or something similar. I suppose, just curious, how soon do you think something like that or an impetus of that scale needs to be put on the industry by government or similar? Renewable hydrogen target? Yeah, Look, before it sort of I th I think, missed the boat. I think we need, well, it's hard to say when the boat's been missed. It may have already been 10 years ago. Um, but I would have thought it would, if the government had the idea today, it probably takes two years as a minimum, just to, to get through to get industry input on, on how, you know, let, let's say you decided you're going to encourage people to use hydrogen-based fuels for, for long distance um, heavy goods transport. It's going to take two years to get through government and industry before you have a legislation in place and then you probably have two years to implement, yeah. or start implementing. So it doesn't happen quickly, right? It's not overnight. Excellent. There's a question online about 
related to time and how fast things can happen um, about the target. So you, you're zero by 2050 in your modeling and it's a straight line from now to then, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, what, why choose that one and what would happen if you made it more rapid decarbonisation? For example, if you were targeting a one and a half degree global warming objective and, and, and so on, because the federal government one, I think, is not going to achieve one and a half degree mm. if, if, if by, by usual assumptions around what's a fair share for Australia. So if we went faster than what you modelled, what would that mean? Good question. I guess the, the, the really simple answer is you go faster, you get there quick, more quickly. Yeah. But I have to say, given, and we, I mean, we we did the simple thing first, which is to do a, lin, a linear, basically linear from now until 2050 to get a feel for the magnitude of the numbers. Yep. And you can see the numbers are enormous. Okay. So, and standing here today, I actually don't know how we would achieve those numbers. <laughs> That means doing it even faster is even more of a problem. Um, and and actually, you would say, it comes back to your question, is we're not going fast enough now um, and it will take us time to get up to speed due to the inertia of society and so on. So that actually means that the more you delay starting now, the faster you have to go as you get closer towards 2050. So then you, you're really, really going very quickly. Hmm. Um, you know, I... I I think I can't see us going faster than numbers that are in the presentation, no, not for the next ten years. Mm. Okay, one from the one from the room. Anyone? Maybe. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, you may have answered it, but in terms of construction and the amount of engineering work in the pipelines at the moment, just for infrastructure and other things, do we really have the capacity here in Australia to actually achieve in engineering terms? you'd have to say probably not well not not now and then you talk about immigration and and what did all those things yeah but five percent of if you can imagine a five percent of gdp activity in country it's very large and the second question is about using car batteries mm -hmm. i noticed most of the multi stories around here don't actually have connections uh to the car parks with um electricity to use that and I believe also with car stackers, you can't actually plug in cars to car stackers that get moved around. Mm. Um, is there talk about getting the town planning requirements now up and running so that these are achievable? Mm. I've, um, it's not clear to me that car connection points in public car parks or places like that is something that's... I was meaning apartments. Okay, apartments. Yeah, okay, apartments differently. So where people live... I mean, I think is an important part of the connection thing. The, I mean, the, it's interesting. The um, in doing this study, one of the uh, we had many, many aha moments in all of this, and but one of the, the really simple aha moments was when we realised just how much energy is in a car petrol tank. A lot. It the amount of energy running around on the streets in petrol tanks is enormous. So if you look at a an electric vehicle, it has sort of an equivalent amount of energy in a battery. And whether it's 80 kilowatt hours or 100 kilowatt hours, it's a number like that. Um, it's a lot of energy. So it's a huge opportunity for grid management in bumping that backwards and forwards. And, and actually, there's a whole bunch of mentality issues that we, as particularly city dwellers, have to get over. So this whole range anxiety thing, it's all rubbish, right? It, it doesn't exist. And if you, when, when we have proper house virtual power plants that talk, or virtual power plant controllers, to talk intelligently between cars and house batteries and house solar panels and then house appliances, then you get a really interesting thing going where your car is buying and selling power and potentially you make money rather than rather than costing you money. Okay, so um oh one more well a couple with some new questions, more more hands appearing. I okay, I'll take one from the online and then we'll come back to the room. So uh, this is about the long-term energy storage, three to five days. Um, is, it, is that sufficient? Uh, good, good question. And, and what do you do if it's not? Do you, do you shut the country down or what do you do? 
Um, so we've done what I would call some, it, it's very basic modeling around this. And I mean, I'm sure Michael, you'll be running a few PhDs in coming years that are trying to address exactly this problem, right? And, and that is, already, if you, already, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a tricky problem. Yeah, it's a tricky problem because you have a geographic distribution of all these randomly variable weather resources. Um, you have consumption going up and down throughout the country and you'll see we've done the modeling on a 24 hour period. We thought that was important because underlying all this, it's electricity. You know? And when it's renewable, then there's a big cycle through the thing with the solar and then the wind is variable on top of that as well. Although our modeling of the wind is pretty basic. Um, yeah, so in the modeling we've done so far, which is very, very first order, um, we think that the you would have to have a very good distribution of generation across the continent. So you maximize your chance of um, getting good weather in some areas when there's bad weather in others. So bad weather might be still and cloudy, mm -hmm. probably still and cloudy in this case. Um, and then you overlay on that, that you have to have some pretty significant amount of battery storage. And you overlay on that, that you've got 60% of your renewable generation is providing hydrogen, which becomes an interruptible load in the worst cases. Mm -hmm. So all of those things come into that, that I made one comment about a, an energy system that we currently don't know how to manage. That's exactly this problem. Yep. Um, and, and then I guess you probably have to account for a worst case situation where actually for 24 hours you go blank. I'm guessing. Yep. Yeah. Because covering off that event is probably just too expensive. Okay. At, we'll, do two, we'll do two more in the room and then we'll wrap it up. So, Professor Monty. Thanks. Uh, fantastic talk. Very interesting. You talked about lots of different things that need to be done. Presumably, there's well, there's going to be different things at different times. So, what does the labor profile required look like over time? I guess that's going to change. Yeah, excellent question. We've done no modeling on labor requirements. Okay, the 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 best we've done is that it's about five percent of GDP. Um, and what we've done is because of the company we are, we actually have a pretty good feel for the relative costs of all these technologies, the implementation issues and so on. Um, so we haven't done um, price or cost optimization. Um, what we've done is level zero engineering and risk mitigation. So how do you make this work and which technologies are likely to be the ones that are chosen on? So one of the bigger reasonable assumptions we made we have a two to one ratio of wind to solar okay. we've done that because wind needs less battery backup than solar because it's more more it's better distributed through the day yeah. whether that's the right solution or is really unclear to us and we don't know how to answer the question not really but and no we haven't modeled the laborers yet it's not other, other than to use the word substantial or challenging over and over and over again. Employment will go up for mechanical engineers though. Yeah. Jason, Jason's head of mech engine. Oh, very good. So that's, we'd like to know that. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Different, well, was, different hey, set, last this, question. This is, this is the, and then there'll the be another last question. The hardest, hardest yeah. question in the room. Yeah, the yeah, question yeah. Um, room. Uh, a question about the role that Siemens is going to play in all of this. What what do you see the the role of Siemens? Um, and then a, a kind of a follow up question is: Does Siemens or technology providers do they have to respond to demand for these new technologies, or can can they supply these technologies ahead of ahead of the demand and sort of so really got, push them out? Is that the ten minute answer? Is that, is that okay? So okay. So um, I think we so I work for Siemens Energy. We make gas turbines, every size you want. We make gas compression, we do high voltage transmission and we make hydrogen electrolyzers. And, and we also make wind turbines. Okay. Um, we currently don't do solar. We currently are playing in batteries. You know, we'd like to have a battery offering. We don't really have one. Um, we like our competitors are trying to work out how to adapt to this new energy world. Okay, so one version of the world in Australia says, you don't want gas turbines in the future. Japan and Korea look different to that. Right? 
they don't have the renewable resources, they'll probably be burning Australian green hydrogen in gas turbines to make electricity in the future. In Australia, we think that will be unnecessary and uneconomic. Um, so the challenge for us as technology companies is we want to play its business. Okay? We also think we have a social responsibility because we actually understand, we think we understand this stuff to help. Um, but it's not easy because the world changes really rapidly. So we've had multiple discussions with state governments around, would you like to build a hydrogen electrolyzer factory in Australia? Love to. Please show me the pipeline of steady projects yeah, and give me a chance to compete. Currently, we don't have that. Yeah. So I think um, uh, Andrew Forrest Group are proposing to build a, an electrolyzer factory in, um, in Queensland. Great first first move, but difficult to fill the factory when the projects aren't being built. So really challenging for all the technology companies. Both it's a huge opportunity, lots of R and D being spent, lots of new players and competitors, and all those things. Um, use the word substantially challenging again in all of this. Um, and things like the transmission network. It's clear it has to grow enormously over the next years, um, and lots of opportunities for grid stabilization, whether it's synchronous condensers, static via compensators, HVDC transmission, all these things, very interesting stuff. Big technology companies will, will all want to play in those. Um, you would think in the transition, and maybe Michael is just, if I go off on a small tangent, one of the real challenges we see more for the country and the industry than the technology providers is by definition, we're in a transition. So that means things are changing and yet we need to invest in assets that have a minimum lifetime of 20 years. So any substantial asset that lasts 20 years is worth a billion dollars, right? They, they come in units of a billion dollars. And so you end up saying to a, a board of a company that sees itself as an energy company, we'd like to invest, you know, the development guys, the the, the fast talking used car sales guys that develop projects, they go to the board and they say, we want to develop this billion dollar project, please approve. This is great, it's got all this business case, the usual thing. But we've got a, 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 a horizon of visibility that's probably five years at best. And it's a 20 year investment. And boards have a fiduciary responsibility to spend their companies wisely to ensure the long term security of the company. I don't know how you make a decision like that as a board at the moment. It's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And that impacts particularly technologies like carbon capture storage, where how do you have any view on the, the commercial viability of the thing? And will you invest on a 20 year project if you don't have that security? I think in most cases, the answer is no. And then you get stuck. That's the hard thing. Yep. All right, final question. Thanks, Michael. David Brockway, formerly of uh, CSIRO. Um, your overall um, scenario is very similar to the Net Zero Australia one that Melbourne University is involved in, but there's some interesting much nuances. more detailed than mine, <laughs> Yeah, there's some really interesting nuances that are quite different, and one of them is to do with, the, um, with your comment, and this is following up a bit on an answer you gave previously, but um, where you're talking about the amount of renewables we'll have that can be switched off basically from hydrogen. So it's about eight times what we need for the domestic supply. And we can just use that to um, supply the power that we need domestically. I note that um, I was monitoring superficially spot prices for power over late July through August. And most of the time it was three to $600 a megawatt hour. So I was going well over 10,000 for short periods. That indicates that um, for a four, five, six week period, we were having to run gas turbines a lot. Um, there was very little wind across the whole eastern seaboard and insufficient solar. So just simply switching off all of the uh, hydrogen for export plants and relying on the renewables to run that system for um, upwards of a month, is that going to be sufficient? Is there going to be enough wind 
and solar, although you've got you know, grant you eight times as much capacity there, will there be enough there to actually supply Australia over a longer period like that? So I think that, that's a key question. I, I, I would hesitate to make the link though that you make between what's happening in the markets today and what's going to happen in 2050, you know? So I think that, let, let's split those two things. I mean, the markets today are very, very unusual because of Ukraine and leftover COVID impact and all those things. Um, but the, and I think the other part is then the question is how do you, how do you manage that fully renewable energy system where you have worst case weather conditions and how long does worst case run for? That's the sort of the design question. And how much pain are you willing to take? What's, what's your, if it goes past this, I'm willing to go black. What does that look like? And it, it may be that you say, well, I'm never willing to go black. So I've got to spend more money in Australia um, with that picture we've painted. We're actually in a better position than nearly every other country in the world, right? Because we're going to have, if we build something like what we're postulating here, we'll have so much excess renewables, we've actually got a chance of running through bad weather conditions um, as a nation by shutting down the 60% of hydrogen. Right? But um, how much battery storage do you use? How much pump storage hydro do you have? These are they're the design questions we've got to, we have to address in the coming three decades. Good. Good way to end it. I think so. Please uh, thank Mike for Michael for a great talk, and um, thanks everyone for coming along in person and uh, the very healthy audience numbers online as well. So thanks everyone, and um, see you at the next seminar. Won't be as good as this one because I'm giving it. <laughs> good afternoon.